Thanks everybody for coming here today. Uh, special thanks to the organizers and volunteers who set up all this conference. Um, really appreciate the hard work, especially coming on a, on a holiday weekend. My name is Adam Hogan. Uh, I'm an engineer with CrowdStrike, and I'm talking today about uh, pirates. I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. Uh, the growth in, in, in cybercrime actually reminds me a lot in the, the growth in piracy. So I want to look at how piracy grew, how it became, and in its golden age. And I suppose there's a couple of real uh, points in history where piracy became a really big deal. Uh, so I want to look at that as far as like why did it grow, and of course how were they able to stop the pirates as things we can learn from. Uh, this actually got started at last year's Eastside Columbus. Um, if anyone was there, uh, I actually gave a talk on the, on the economics of exploit kits, and at the very end, I uh, had some like throwaway ideas about how this kind of reminded me of pirates. Uh, and I got like all my feedback was like that part on pirates is awesome. All right, um, <laughs> uh, let's let's dig into that some more and, and do a whole talk. Um, so I started looking at, at pirates and gave a uh, first talk on this at, at B-Sides uh, Cleveland. Talked a lot about these sort of individual decisions that people went through in order to become a criminal and, and why we should do that. Uh, it's very, very, very much in, in economic theory, uh, which is which is my background. My, my uh, graduate work in economics sort of looking at the individual choice to become a pirate. So what were the risks, what were the benefits, right? These guys are making serious bank. Uh, you know, the risks sort of ebbed and flowed depending on policy, depending on where they were in the world. Um, one thing that really come out of that was not only like, okay, wow, this, there's some serious incentives here. These guys were making like 10, 20 times what you could, you know, working a legitimate vessel, right? Uh, so if you had the kind of experience, then, man, they were, they were making really good money. Uh, but also learned that they were incredibly, incredibly innovative. Uh, pirates are able to come up uh, with a whole lot of, seriously, uh, social inventions. Um, they really uh, address the paradox of, of power. Uh, in the idea that they were giving their captain authority over them uh, because when you go into war, you don't get to vote on everything. Actually, when they weren't at war, they voted on everything. Turns out pirates were incredibly democratic uh, and, and well ahead of the time there, uh, but they, uh, they sort of appointed a, a captain when they're at war, they did whatever he said, right? Now, they didn't like it. As soon as they got out of the war, it's like, okay, we're good, we're safe, right? C uh, captain. You're a dick. You're out. Right? They vote them right on the spot. Right? Uh, we'll talk about it. Actually, happens a couple times. You're not doing what they want. You're out. So incredibly democratic, but also set up social structures uh, that were very much built to protect them from a captain uh, that might let things go to his head and, and run wild. So I talked a lot about that um, and a lot about how uh, rational um, the idea uh, of their their violence was. Right? Which isn't. Some of you know are put together, but flying the pirate flag, the, the Jolly Roger that makes up my, my background here, uh, and frankly a lot of others like it, uh, was very much a signal. It says, surrender or we'll murder you. Right? And it's because they didn't want to have to murder you. It's a lot of work. Right? <laughs> and, and there's some risk involved. You might try and murder me back, which is your right and everything, sure, but don't want that to happen. So if I can convince you if I don't surrender, you know, I'll, I'll murder you, then you'll just surrender and I won't have to. And that's wonderful, right? So they're, they're all very logical about it. They cultivated reputations so that they didn't have to murder people. So um, we're starting there, but, but for the most part, I want to move uh, sort of past those individual decisions and, and all this sort of like social thing. <coughs> sort of like, okay, great. If pirates are really like cyber criminals and I can make this analogy, then how do they stop them? How do they go in and, and, and put it into the pirates? How do they hunt them down? How do they stop them? Uh, and so let's see if we can learn from there. Uh, I, I think it is very important that we understand our adversaries. Um, not just their tool craft, right? Uh, we see a lot of focus on and security on tools, right? Let's, uh, let's get the IOCs for the right uh, muskets and cutlasses, and then we'll be able to find the bad guys, right? Well, what if we can actually understand the actors involved? What if we can understand uh, how they operate and, and, and gather that intelligence as well? Uh, but also, there's just not a lot of experimental data uh, on criminals, and it's something that, that we as a, as a group suffer from uh, immensely, right? This is not an empirical science. We don't really get to share data, right? Maybe we should be working on ways to do that or whatever, but for the most part, we don't. Uh, so uh, instead of putting together elaborate experiments and things like uh, physical science, um, it, you're uh, here listening to me talk about pirates. Uh, so well, let's see what we can learn from this kind of allegory. Um, and of course, 
uh, I've also had tremendous success using these ideas and using these as analogies to communicate uh, with the people I work with. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you can have all the technical data you want. If you can't sell to the people upstairs, it uh, doesn't really matter. And these kind of analogies have helped me a great deal. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping they can help you as well. So at first I looked at organized crime. Like, okay, these hackers are sort of an organized crime. Let's look at that. And the theory didn't fit at, fit at all, which sort of led me to pirates. Pirates were the one sort of social organization we've seen in the history sort of matched up with what hackers are doing. That, that they're not... Uh, almost all organized crime was based on uh, a black market that we're actually kind of into, right? Yeah, like gambling or prostitution or drugs. People are like, well, I kind of like those things. Uh, so th it's not always uh, opposed 100%, right? Uh, whereas there, there really hasn't been a whole lot of actual thieves' guilds, right? Uh, which is essentially what pirates and, and hackers often are. But also the chaos and scope of the sea, uh, especially centuries ago, really sort of matches the problem of tracking people through the internet. So let's talk about, about Threat Hunter in this case, like uh, how do they actually track down pirates uh, and, and stop them. So at a high level, uh, really pulling from, um, from the, some of the books on, on pirates here, uh, there are three major ways they're looking to actually go and stop these pirates. Uh, one, uh, find and attack them at sea. Two, find them at anchor or while they're careening, and I'll go into each of these uh, in a bit here. Uh, or three, uh, attacking their haunts or ports where they might uh, you know, likely to find, or, or maybe wherever they are habitually. That being said, uh, even that is, is sort of presupposing the idea that someone is going out and doing the hunting, and that is not always super clear. Uh, we still have to ask the question, who has the right to hunt pirates? Uh, who has the responsibility or duty to hunt pirates? And, and of course, then, if we figure that out, who's going to pay for us to go and hunt pirates in the first place? Um, which all sort of comes back to a lot of the structure in international law that developed in order to say, okay, what was right and wrong for, for attacking pirates or responding to attack on international waters, uh, which something very much applies to issues we're facing in the cybersecurity uh, industry here, um, and, and I hope we'll have time to, to come back to that. So the first one was, let's find and see. Uh, Terrible strategy. <laughs> Doesn't work, right? Um, and, and reading from uh, this book, Pirate Hunting, uh, he said, the idea that you go out and find a pirate at sea uh, is an easy proposition only in novels and motion pictures. The open sea was too large and, that not even, uh, and was not, in fact, even considered a place to seek pirates or anyone else for that matter. Coastal routes, common routes among the islands, and common landfalls were better pickings, especially when matched with the sailings uh, of merchantmen but searches were often fruitless without good intelligence. Sound a little familiar? Yep. All right. So, uh, yeah, we can't just like, all right, we're going to go look for pirates. Uh, the, the sea opened up a whole new realm because you couldn't just like, okay, where does he live? What's his address? Cool, I'm going to go find him, right? It really doesn't work like that when you're looking for pirates. But that second one was finding when they were anchored or when they were careening. Uh, careening is when you actually beat your boat and scrape off all the barnacles and worms and crap that get stuck to the side because they will eat through the ship. All right. So you actually had to do this with, uh, with wooden ships every now and then just to, just to keep the thing running. Of course, while you're doing that, you're incredibly vulnerable. Right? If someone is, trying, is, is out to you know, find you uh, and they happen to sail by while your boat is on the land, uh, they can take their time shooting holes in that boat. Right? So very, very vulnerable while they're uh, at their base, uh, especially when they're hungover. Uh, that sounds random. It's not. Uh, once we get in the case study later about how pirates actually got found or when some actual historic pirates were found and, and uh, uh, shut down, um, uh, man, reoccurring theme uh, is when we actually got to find the pirates, uh, it's because they were hungover and we found them in a bay someplace where they were anchored or craning. But that was sort of a double edged sword, too. Um, you know, if you can find people because, oh, well, that's where they usually anchor, well, I can go looking for them. Well, that's a two-way street. Uh, reading again from the book on, on empire hunting, uh, in the case of the Armada de Barlovento, a uh, Spanish uh, fleet that was sailing around looking for pirates, it, its established route was predictable and thus was easily avoided unless it changed its route or its timing. The privateers and pirates, they kept out of its way, having always intelligence where they are. Uh, in the case of guard ships, many were too slow to, uh, too deep drafted, or not in good condition to set sail immediately. However, the patrolling based on good intelligence could be productive. The sack of Veracruz by filibusters and buccaneers in the 1683 spurred the Armada de Barlovento into retaliatory action, for example. Over the course of a deliberate focused cruise, the Armada captured six purported pirate vessels and 110 pirates. 
Um, so there's a few things in there. Uh, one is that, yeah, uh, if I have a, a, a predictable routine, then you can come and find me, but same for the uh, pirate hunters. Uh, a lot of them were just doing routine patrols, uh, or say like the Coast Guard had very specific area they were patrolling. And it's like, okay, well, just don't go there, right? Uh, so these are your firewalls of the time, right? Yeah, uh, if you happen to come through here, we will check to see if you're known, uh, known bad and, and stop you uh, if we happen to figure that out. Uh, but uh, one, we could sail around you. Uh, and two, uh, it was incredibly common for, for pirates to have just a stack of like different passports. Like what country are you from? Like, uh, what country do you want me from, right? Uh, they had a bunch of different flags, all these papers that set up to you know, just lie their way past, uh, past these kind of stops. Um, Let's see. Uh, also, the, the tactical issue was enormous. Uh, it said of guard ships, they were too slow, too deep drafted. So the military it was constantly patting themselves on the back. I can take any pirate, right? Put me in a one-on-one -on -one fight with a pirate, we'll take him. And that was true. That's almost always true. That's just not a thing that happened, right? They're, they're sort of inventing this, uh, they're like, yeah, we can take them. And it was basically like saying, well, okay, uh, who would win in a fight, Wolverine or Batman? Uh, it's just, it's not going to happen. Some of you are thinking because they're not real. I'm thinking because one's Marvel and one's DC. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the idea was that when the military showed up, it's like, hey, I got a warship. I'm here to capture a pirate. pirate. Pirates are like, bye, I'm leaving. Uh, and they're gone. Because right? they were in much smaller, much faster ships. You show up in a warship, and they just scamper off up to the coast or like up a river uh, where these giant warships just couldn't go. So the military's like, here, I'm here to hunt pirates. And I'm like, see you. Bye. Uh, and, they're gone, right? So you actually had to uh, be able to find them, like, you know, out and about. Um, <coughs> also, man, like, yeah, they would, pirates actually tried to take her crews. They tried to take the city because one of the things we'll get into is pirates are most successful when they can establish a real base of operations. Uh, that one didn't work out so well. Yeah, the Spanish came after them, and they almost didn't have to. They stacked the city, and um, uh, they were so uh, disappointed with how much stuff there was to steal in this little town. They went digging up graves. Uh, which was really easy, because a lot of those graves were fresh, which should have been a warning. Um, <laughs> so they dug up all those graves to steal their gold and all the stuff they've been buried with, uh, and got the plague that had just killed them. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, the, the uh, Spanish were able to sail in and like, liberate the city, but they were basically wrapping up like three broken down plague-ridden pirates, or whoever was left of the plane. Right? Uh, and yeah, we can go and capture pirates like at their, when they're at port. Like, so let's find them in these bases. But again, okay, which port? We have to have, again, we have to have that intelligence about their operations, about their activities, about their procedures in order to track them down, uh, or that's not exactly helpful advice. Uh, so attacking their haunts or ports was used on occasion and sometimes even effectively. However, no matter how the pirate hunter intended to track down and destroy his prey, he needed intelligence regarding private locations, anticipated destinations, the speed to overtake the pirate, or at least arrive at, uh, at his location before he absconded, the men and arms to overwhelm him, and the capable commanders to apply the appropriate leadership and tactics. And they didn't always have those things. Because going after pirates, one of the issues we'll see was always that it wasn't necessarily a priority. Because it took so long to go and find pirates, the navies uh, really weren't that willing to uh, task resources to it. Because uh, one, uh, one uh, because they've got other things to do, often because, uh, I mean, if we're looking through like the I mean, 16 to 1800s, uh, they were constantly going to war with each other, right? Uh, yeah, the British Navy could come in and swap out all these pirates anytime they wanted, but they were fighting Napoleon, or whatever it was, right? Uh, each other constantly back and forth throughout this entire time period, right? right? So while there's wars going on, uh, taking these, care of these pirates was absolutely not a priority. All right, so one of the reasons pirates were able to be so effective is that they were able to build little cities, little bases of operations, and build societies where they could flourish. Uh, and I have the quote here, I'm doing all an enormous favor and not singing uh, from this operetta, but uh, what they're captured uh, in uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's lyrics here is uh, a sort of the fun of being a pirate king. And it turns out that's when pirates got really successful. Uh, this old painting of Nassau, uh, where pirates ran the show. They had their own little city going, and it wasn't the first, right? You could say the same of, of Tortuga for a time, uh, Port Royal for a time, where pirates were basically running the city. They had sort of taken over, and of course, there we're talking about a situation where they could absolutely flourish because they didn't have to hide. They could actually have a stable base where they could hang out, where they could do maintenance on their ships, where they could spend their money, 
uh, which was a big, uh, big plus. If you're luring people in with the promise of riches, it doesn't really matter if like uh, you're so shunned you can't go and actually spend this money. Um, uh, of course, there's a couple of uh, you know, there's a couple like British soldiers stand by and doing absolutely nothing. Pirates you know, just, just walk right by. It didn't matter. Pirates ran the place. Um, so that was going on, especially here in NASA. They had sort of built a smuggler economy at first. Before it was outright piracy, it was a lot of smugglers. And the idea that various governments were trying to control when and where you could trade. Uh, and you could uh, go ahead and take another 30-40% profit if you could get around having to pay imports, uh, taxes and stuff, right? Uh, so they started with a smaller economy. It's kind of a gray market, more than say black market, depending on, on, on how you look at it. Uh, but of course, it's building up an infrastructure that pirates can also then, then take a look up. So again, you need a place to spend your money uh, to attract young men to go out and, and you know, maybe get killed. Uh, so uh, taverns and brothels, big part of big enough that and building up that infrastructure. Uh, and it was really started, as far as when they started to take themselves seriously, like, hey, we're going to build our own society here. Uh, when uh, Benjamin Hornigold sort of uh, took over, uh, he came in, uh, and then later championed by Charles Vane. If you've ever seen like pirate movies or something, you've probably heard those before. Um, or there's a couple TV shows. Again, these characters pop up again. Um, now, their motivations were, were uh, numberable. It wasn't just, hey, let's get rich. There was a lot of politics involved. There was a lot of nationalism involved. Um, Hornigold was able to set up because he was part of this Jacobite function, and that uh, he was actually a part of the British Navy under um, uh, Queen Anne uh, and the, the Stuart line. Uh, and fundamentally, I believe that once the Catholics were back in power in England, which never happened, uh, but he said, like, as soon as that happens, then I'm not a pirate, I'm actually the legitimate Navy. So he didn't think of himself as a pirate at all, he thought of himself as a privateer. The difference between a pirate and a privateer is uh, a government can issue what's called a letter of mark and reprisal. Once you have that, they basically say, like, hey, we're at war with this country. If you see any ships from that country, you can take them. Their stuff is illegally yours. Right? Uh, so that's a, that's a privateer. So a lot of these, and most of these pirates, we fundamentally talk about pirates and all, and through NASA here and all these other uh, places, uh, it's fine calling them pirates. But they didn't think of themselves that way. Right? They thought they were, some of them thought that they were doing was legal, some of them had uh, just justified it, some of them thought they were doing the, uh, the right thing and it was part of, of backing their country or their religion or whatever it was. Uh, of course, they were getting crazy wealthy as well. Right? Uh, again, uh, for an average pirate to be able to go out there, you're looking at, I don't know, you go out and sail for about three months on an average pirate uh, cruise, uh, and in that time, uh, if you didn't die, uh, you'd make about 10 to 20 times what an average sailor would make in a year. So uh, considerable there, and of course their, their pride, because at this point they had built this city. They thought they were going to have like a legitimate uh, uh, um, republic of pirates here, uh, and they were very proud of that. So Hornigold uh, really started that off. He was the commander of the Ranger. His second commander was Edward Teach, who would go on to become uh, <coughs> Captain Blackbeard. Uh, and again, he thought of himself as a tremendous patriot. He would not attack uh, British ships. Uh, which backfired on him. His crew was like, hey, we, there's a bunch of British ships that went by, we'd really like to steal from them. And he's like, no. So they said, you're out. Again, this happens all the time. They don't like the captain, we'll vote you out, leave you on a little island, best of luck to you. Um, again, so he was an out of work privateer after Queen Anne's War. So he was a legitimate soldier uh, in, in Queen Anne's government fighting in that war. And afterwards, really thought, like, okay, I'm not a, a pirate, I'm a privateer temporarily out of power, right? But then once my people get back into power, I'm the legitimate Navy, right? Uh, and he is him that really thought that Nassau could be this Republic of Pirates. Uh, now that didn't work out, uh, and expelling the pirates was actually such a, a huge part of the identity of Nassau. If you go to Nassau, uh, Rogers is still a name you'll see on streets and everything. That was the governor who was actually in charge when they ousted all the pirates, and we'll talk about how in a little bit. Uh, and the Bahamas' official motto is still uh, expel the pirates, uh, commerce resto restored. All right, so very much a part of the culture today. That's actually like <coughs> still the um, uh, flag uh, of the Bahamas. There. So, uh, looking for some parallels, uh, I may have been more too specific in, in, in naming the talk about the 1600s, because one of the uh, themes that sort of came back to is when uh, the bad guys are able to build a base. Uh, they're incredibly effective. Another time they're able to do that is when we look at the Barbary pirates. The Barbary pirates are those operating out of uh, Algiers, uh, Tunis, Tripoli, uh, and Morocco. Um, 
they demanded tribute to basically sail around the Mediterranean. It's like, hey, if you want to sail around here, you have to pay us or we'll attack you. We'll attack you, we'll steal your stuff, and we will take all your people and sell them into slavery. Uh, so this was not safe for Americans. Uh, they were not able to reach this goal. They're like, hey, you got to pay us like we have no money. Uh, and frankly, they were pretty used to the uh, British looking out for them. Right? About this time, this was just after the Revolutionary War. Uh, they did not have a navy. Uh, the British have been really kind of doing that for them. So they're like, just calling off military welfare here. Like, we don't have one of our own. Uh, what are we going to do here? Uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to, uh, to sail around here. So uh, the Barbary Pirates are actually capturing a couple ships, uh, the Maria and the Dauphin, and then uh, selling uh, their crew and passengers uh, into slavery. So John Adams goes over to the people and right, asks them, like, how can you do this? Like, we didn't do anything to you. Why are you uh, you're capturing us? And they said, well, according to the Quran, it's totally okay. Uh, we, can, we can rob you. We can sell you into slavery. Uh, it's really not a big deal. And if we happen to die while we're doing it, we go immediately to heaven. So great deal for us. So huge problem there. And again, this kind of comes back to, not that it's anything unique to, to Islam. Again, what we're finding is not that people are like, I want to be a criminal. They look for some other motivation to get involved, right? Whether it were this guy saying, like, well, I'm going to you know, back the Catholics and British, or whether it's this guy saying, like, our religion says, okay, to steal from you. There's some other motivation that's going on there. So Jeffrey and Adam start arguing, trying to figure out, like, look, are we just going to pay them, try to avoid them, or are we going to build a military and go after them and, and fight them? Um, Jefferson wanted to go and fight him. Adams uh, was fighting, was, was arguing against him, but uh, eventually got convinced. Uh, the biggest problem being, it's like, well, you don't have to convince me. We have to convince Congress to give us some money. This actually predated, this argument sort of predated the Constitution uh, when it was extraordinarily difficult to get uh, money. They didn't have a navy because after the Revolution War, they sold all the ships they had in order to pay for the previous war. They, uh, this is, that's how long ago this was. The government thought they had to pay their debts. It was crazy. They had, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> they, um, they had literally sold off the Navy and, and used that money to, to, to pay down the debts. And uh, President Washington was all, was all in for it because he didn't think the country should have a military laying around. He thought they might be tempted to use it and didn't think that was a great idea. Wild stuff, right? Um, <laughs> Jefferson comes back and says, look, we don't actually need that big of a military. I need six frigates. These pirates are kind of shabby. Right? Yeah, they're attacking people. They don't got much going for them. They're not great ships. They're not great at their cannons. What they basically do is pull up alongside you and like uh, 50 dudes jump over your boat like it's ours now. So we don't even have to be that great of a movie. I just have to be able to be, have a few cannons to shoot these guys while they're creeping up on us. So they go ahead and build that. Um, and in 1794, Washington signs uh, this bill to provide for, for, for building these six frigates uh, after Congress passed it. Uh, talk about crazy. Um, he didn't just run off and do this on his own. Uh, so they started building this navy, and then when Jeff Jefferson was president, they really start putting this to work because they're seeing a lot more uh, aggression from the Barbary pirates. Um, and even then, when he sent the warships over, they were only to defend uh, the American uh, merchant ships. Uh, they literally weren't allowed to fight back that much. Like, if the, if the pirates attacked, and then turned to run, they're like, you have to stop. Uh, because Congress hadn't approved of war. Again, this is how long ago this was. Wild stuff, right? So the president's like, I don't have the authority to send to war, but you can go over and defend people. So they send those over, uh, and the USS Enterprise, which is not the first uh, time I get to say that name, which is all sorts of fun, uh, but they go over there uh, and um, capture the Tripoli, because they sail around under a false flag. Again, everyone did this. They're running, uh, I think, the like Great Britain's flag. Um, and they pull up next to this Barbary pirate ship. So like, hey, how's it going? Uh, they're like, well, we're out hunting Americans. He's like, you don't say. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> they lower their British flag. They hike up the American flag because you can, you can lie about country you're from, but not if you want to open fire. And he did. Because uh, it's like, uh, literally, this is this, like, I don't know, like one-tenth of the American Navy at this point being captained by like, a 22-year-old kid who really wanted to go to war. So uh, it got in a position where he was legally allowed to do that. Uh, so they actually take this ship, and this is huge victory. We captured a ship uh, from, from the Barbary Pirates. All downhill from there. Everything started going wrong. They, they, they went over there to, to check it out, um, and they're like, hey, we're the American military. We're here to, you know, we're here to make it safe for our guys. And they're like, welcome. Let me draw you into uh, to the Bay of Tripoli here. They're like, okay. So they hand over the keys of the ship. 
Uh, and they let their pilot steer in the boat, and they park it in the middle of all their cannons. Um, so it's like, you're going to do what we say. Uh, so they actually had the, uh, the day, which is the sort of governor there, hijack the ship. He's like, by the way, you need to take me over to my buddy's place, and I'm bringing um, a bunch of cows and some lions and some parrots uh, and a bunch of slaves. Not what the military wants to be doing with their time. Horrendous embarrassment. The USS Philadelphia goes over there, try to ransom some people back, like, hey, we're the American military, we're here to mess stuff up. And uh, on their way, grounded the ship in the middle of the bay. <laughs> <laughs> so they're stuck. They're just like, hey, we're chasing pirates, we're, you know, we're here to own the day, and then they're just like a turtle on his back, like, we got nothing. Right? <laughs> uh, so they try to sink it, the ship, uh, and they fail to. So they actually had to have a whole other mission where guys snuck up in the middle of the night and set fire to the ship so the, so the uh, uh, pirates couldn't, couldn't capture this thing. Which was heralded a tremendous successful mission, but again, they were just getting back to zero. Uh, they didn't really see any success until uh, I said, look, our Navy is uh, in its infancy. This isn't working. So the, uh, I don't know, a good chunk of the, the Marine Corps, all eight of them, uh, <laughs> they're just like, we'll handle this. So they get on land, they go and they get about 500 mercenaries who are actually backing, not the guy in charge in Tripoli, but his older brother who was supposed to be in power, like, hey, let's do some regime change. Right? This is new. Uh, so they are like, okay, we're going to go back you. They take that. So the 500 mercenaries now go and take the city and say, hey, uh, we got your city. Maybe you stop taking our ships. And they did, right? Uh, and in fact, if, if any of uh, the any Marines... So the hymn starts, what, halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, and this is why. <laughs> All right, so these Barbary pirates had this whole base where they could operate it. They didn't have to hide from anyone. It was a totally legitimate operation in the eyes of their government. Another time that happened uh, was with John Lafitte. Anyone uh, recognize that name? Big name in New Orleans. You'll actually see his name written on stuff. Streets named after him and everything, right? So this guy was a smuggler, a pirate, privateer, a war hero, uh, and later spy and criminal uh, again. <coughs> so real whirlwind there. Uh, they actually put uh, in 1807 the Embargo Act. They made it illegal for any American ship to go to any foreign port. Uh, so it just shut down international trade, uh, which, despite what you may have heard uh, during the election, is a, a big problem. Um, uh, so there's all these... Um, People upset, like their trade just shut down. So people don't just quit and go home, right? Uh, they get into smuggling. So all this whole smuggling culture uh, came out of nowhere. And yes, they're criminals, but people love them, right? I mean, if, if, if smugglers were the only reason you could go to the store and get food and things to buy and such, you'd be a big fan of smugglers too, just as the people there were. Um, so the smugglers got involved, and one of them was uh, Jean Lafitte and his brother Pierre. Not to be confused with Jean Pierre Lafitte. The pirate-themed wrestler in WWF went, was going out and like stealing Bret Hart's jacket for a while. <laughs> I knew there would be a lot of hits on that joke, but <laughs> it's still going to make it, right? Um, <laughs> all right, so they set up this huge smuggling operation again. One of the reasons they're so successful, they set up their own base. They took over a little island, set this up, and when they got tired of smuggling goods into New Orleans, they're like, we're big. You guys come to us. They started holding auctions. But the people were into it. This wasn't really a crime at this point. So he gets into piracy, steals a ship, or buys his first ship, steals three more, gets rid of that first ship because now he's got even better ships. Has his own little fleet going where he can go out and start stealing from people he doesn't like, right? And again, he's maintained this reputation with the people back home, so he's stealing from other countries. Uh, anytime he's got people, he uh, lets them go. He doesn't murder them like a lot of other pirates. No, 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 we let the people go. And they're like, this guy's all right. So they keep that reputation. Now, this goes on for a while, and then the government decides, we've got to do something about that. We can't just let people go around being criminals, so let's all go and fight them. And then people are like, nah, not cool with this guy. <laughs> so, like, okay, now we, got, we need federal help to do it. Uh, governor offers $500 for the capture of, of, of Jean Lafitte. Two days later, there were flyers all over town offering $500 for capture of the governor. <laughs> Historians argue convincingly that it was not the pirate that did that. That's just how much this guy was like that there were all these trolls in town willing to go to bat for him. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so they got to go to the attorney general and they say they charge him not with piracy but with evading revenue. Right? It's evading the tax man. It's like, well, we can't have that. Uh, so they send in 40 soldiers to bust up one of these auctions. So they're in jail. Now, the problem is, we're getting into the War of 1812. The War of 1812, they decided to defend New Orleans by issuing letters of marque 
and creating these privateers who go out and get rich off of busting up any British who came to their door. Nearly all of the people they had issued letters of mark to worked for Jean Lafitte and are now in jail. So they're in jail. Uh, uh, Pierre Lafitte's in jail. Uh, Jean Lafitte actually escapes, but he gets approached by the British who actually offer him citizenship and say, look, if you fight for us, we pardon you, we give you lands. Uh, there's a big land grant involved and take care of that. And he's kind of weighing his option and figures out, ah, I'm pretty sure Americans are going to win this war. Uh, but then the Americans still were trying to arrest him and barely escaped, but the, the military now came in and seized all the pirates' boats and captured a bunch of the rest of the pirates. Well, Andrew Jackson comes down to New Orleans and says, hey, there's a war going on. You guys are getting attacked like any day now. How is your military all set up? They're like, well, you're in luck. We just stole all these pirate boats. He's like, great. Who sails? And he's like, huh? we got no one. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, so you have no active defenses, and there's this active war going on. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. All right. So. They bust all the pirates out of jail, have them go back to being the privateers saying, look, you try to focus on the British and we'll try and turn an eye. And they're like, yeah, yeah we'll try. Uh, so <laughs> the, pirates, the pirates are now free to go back out there. Basically, everyone's happy except a couple you know, people in government are like, yeah, I was going to bust these guys, right? Uh, and they run an incredibly successful campaign. Uh, they were better at, at sailors than all, all of the legitimate uh, military they had. Uh, they set up three artillery units and knew how to use the cannons far better than any of the military. So not only did they come out of the war with pardons, uh, but with uh, praise. Like, yeah, you guys saved the day. All right? Um, yes, yeah, so he ends up setting up a whole new base in Galveston, which apparently you can still visit the ruins of. Uh, it's down there near the, near the harbor. Uh, he worked it for a spy during the Spanish and was eventually driven out by the uh, USS Enterprise. Uh, and just throw that in there again. Right? <laughs> I think it was a different ship at this point, but... Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Right? Um, okay, so we, we've seen this with, uh, when pirates can build up their base, they have quite the operation they're able to, to go through. So, okay, how do we stop them? And we talked a bit about that in the beginning, but let's, let's dig into how they actually did it. Well, first, was that they needed the legislation to even allow people to go after pirates. In the 1500s, you needed two eyewitnesses who were not pirates to convict a pirate. So the pirate's like, you're saying if I kill all the witnesses, I can't go to jail? And they're like, yeah, that's how it works. And that was a problem. <laughs> Took them a long time to change that law, though. It really wasn't, uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't until 1536 that they changed the law. Like, okay, we can, uh, we can actually uh, have a jury hear testimony of your accomplices. So uh, not giving you the active incentive to murder people, uh, but now get to the point where, okay, authorities can you know, flip one of the pirates and get them to testify on the others. Um, and it was a huge problem in the colonies, because like, well, if you capture a, a pirate in, uh, in the American colonies, you have to try them in England. It's a bit of a logistical problem. Uh, so it wasn't until 1700 they passed a law allowing to set up vice admiralty courts in the colonies in order to start trying pirates, uh, which is the first time anyone has really going to like, give it an effort now. We're not bringing these pirates all the way back to England, right? This, that's, uh, that's nuts. Uh, so they set up these courts and started providing bounties to go and capture the pirates. So now we've got an incentive to go out and capture pirates and also the ability to legally uh, convict them, throw them in prison. What other policy do they have? Um, they also tried issuing pardons. Like, uh, maybe pirates just uh, want to go legit. Let's give them a chance. Uh, so this is something I tried, uh, particularly in Nassau, which I'll come back to. Uh, also had to step up naval patrols, right? Uh, again, you had to get someone in there. You had to get someone there that's going to spend some time hunting for pirates. The usual Coast Guard activity wasn't going to cut it. And again, that's basically a firewall at this point. Bad guys are like, yeah, let's just go around. Uh, and then they had to promise rewards for the capture of pirates by, by um, uh, offering bounties, but also licensing private ships to attack and capture pirates. So now, okay, let's, let's set up uh, an actual incentive to go out and get them because we can't have enough military to patrol everywhere pirates might be. Uh, we're going to have to have someone go and look for them. Uh, and then, yeah, now that we can tr put uh, pirates on trial and start executing them, hopefully that will uh, reduce the incentive to become a pirate in the first place. Again, they tried this pardon. So they actually had King George work out a blanket pardon for pirates. Uh, so they go to Nassau and say, this, which is, again, a city run by pirates, in the park, and say, hey, the king forgives you. That reception for that was mixed, right? 
about 50% of them ended up accepting the pardon. Right? Hey, this is great. So it seems that there were a few people like, well, maybe I don't want to be a pirate anymore. I kind of got driven in this life. I'd like to have a legitimate life. I'm basically a criminal for a, for a, a, a living. No one's going to marry me. Uh, I got to transition out of this out of this life. Right? Uh, then again, a lot of the pirates who accepted the pardon uh, never stopped being a pirate. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. you're going to forgive all my past crimes? Awesome. Uh, let's go do some new ones. Uh, so. Uh, and the records sort of show that uh, there was this, this mixed effect. Um, we'll see the the uh, governors. Are saying, yeah, I, I don't think this is going to have an effect. Uh, some few indeed surrender and take a certificate uh, of their so doing, and several of them return to the sport again. So they're actually seeing that. So you know, that that might not have worked. Uh, but there were uh, I don't know how many, but uh, you know, some percentage of pirates like yeah okay you pardon me I'm I'm going to give this up and, and you know go legit. So, also giving pirates the opportunity to go straight. So a lot of these pirates actually became privateers. One, because there was another war. This is also a great time to go legit. And a lot of them thought of themselves as a legitimate kind of navy in the first place. So we get back to, say, like the, the War of Quadruple Alliance. Like, hey, we got another whole war. We need privateers. And they're like, great, I can go straight and basically do what I was doing before, but now it's legal. Uh, Benjamin Hornigold, again, so the founder of that republic in Nassau, <coughs> took his commission from Governor Rogers, uh, uh, who was the king appointed governor who was sent in there to deliver this pardon and bring order to the place. Uh, and then he uh, started cruising against uh, Spanish pirates out of Nassau. Like, okay, uh, now I've got papers saying I can go out and take Spanish ships, I got to keep everything I find, and I'm doing it in service of my country. And a lot of this problem grew international law. International, a lot of international law came from these problems that arised at sea because they were generally recognized as, as international waters, right? And it sort of started with, uh, with Hugo Grotius, uh, who wrote, uh, the, they thought this, this book called The Free Sea. Uh, turns out it was actually a chapter in a larger book called the, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, but essentially the uh, Ethics and Law Surrounding Prize and Booty, uh, which is always fun to say. Uh, <laughs> But, so they had sort of set this out, that like, look, there's such a thing as international waters, no one country gets to put jurisdiction. So, yeah, you get this sort of cooperation, and you don't maybe want one country taking everything over, but uh, we also then have to figure out, like, where jurisdiction is. If there are crimes at sea, what are we going to do about them? Uh, that's an issue uh, we're actually tackling recently in the realm of cybersecurity. It was only a few years ago that the first Talon Manual on Cyber War was put out. Uh, it was put out by, I kid you not, the International Group of Experts. That's what they call themselves. The gall of it, I can't imagine. But they got together, all these lawyers and, and, and uh, academics and uh, a couple of officials from NATO to actually look at how it is the international law we already have uh, as far as like just war and, and international waters and, and telecommunications. Uh, how does that apply to potential cyber war? So we we're just in the past few years laying the groundwork for, um, for the legal framework uh, to address this. This document's actually non-binding, uh, but there's nobody else trying to clarify this, so it's probably going to be the, the front runner. If you Google Talon Manual, it'll pop right up. Uh, Amazon sells a copy of it for way too much, and the PDF's free online. <laughs> um, it's very easy to read uh, because, it, honestly, like in bold are the major points, and then after that are a bunch of legalese nonsense. But you can basically go through, like, rule one: uh, what's your sovereignty? Can you, you know, fight back if you're attacked? Right? Uh, it may not be as interesting as some as you hope because it's really very focused on an attack that is obviously an attack, like a cyber attack that causes physical damage. Right? Shuts down the power grid, hurts people, things like that. Uh, and apparently, they are revising it to look at more subtle. Cyber attacks. Apparently, that version, the 2.0 version, addresses some of those more similar points. Going to be coming out later this month, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, to seeing that, seeing where it's going from here. So, really, just now laying out the, the legal framework, and I actually think it, it's a lot of it's going to come back to that international law that's <coughs> trying to deal with with, with pirates. Right. So, again, how can we actually fight these pirates? Well, they saw one of the ways was with privateers. <coughs> I mean, yeah, in theory, our Navy's supposed to do this, but there's not enough of them, uh, and then we've got other stuff for them to do. So uh, we can actually issue letters of mark ourselves, hire some people, and say, look, hey, if you're out there, yeah, you're a trading vessel. But if you see some pirates and you capture them, you get to keep their boat and uh, everything on board, right? 
pretty good deal. Uh, and they could uh, supplement that with bounties, saying, look, you know, get these specific pirates, uh, and there's, there's money in for it. Uh, they could recruit the pirates, is what we saw with Hornigold. Like, hey, come back and, and be legit again. Uh, you can still be a pirate, but you know, we'll give you a paper to say it's cool. Uh, but then uh, also a big part of that was getting in a uh, legitimate government built in Nassau to remove that support organization. Because if the pirates had set up their own base, they were entrenched. Right? Now we can do some of these in, 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 in the, the realm of, of cybercrime. Uh, although I, I think removing a support organization is, is pretty difficult, right? Uh, of course, you'll see that we, oh, they busted up uh, Silk Road. They shut it down. They put the guy in jail. It was like a week later, there's another Silk Road? Right? 72 hours. Yeah, 72 right. hours. Right? Um, has anyone not seen The Wire? Good, right? And so, again, what's the, the last, what, five minutes of season one is we got all the guys in jail, and then they, they show the, the same corners, and every all the low-level guys have just moved out and they're selling drugs, right? Uh, shutting down sport organization on the internet, I don't think that's going to work, right? I mean, yeah, maybe getting all wrecked in jail was uh, was a step forward in the eyes of the government for, for daring to, to sell this website uh, where, where people could, could trade with each other peacefully instead of on these violent quarters. Uh, but uh, that's going to be pretty tough on the internet. Uh, but these other options are, are available. So with Nassau, yeah, they hired him as a pirate hunter, uh, but Charles Vane wasn't on board. In fact, he read a revolt against the new governor <laughs> and everyone who accepted the pardons. He's like, you're not against us, or you're not with us, you're, for, you're against us, so he's going after them as well. He builds a whole fleet. <clears throat> he really gets some ground. Like, people are on his side. He's got, I don't know, maybe half a dozen ships in his fleet. It goes from Captain Vane to Commodore at this point. He's got a whole fleet of pirates that are pushing back against this, and they got wiped out by a hurricane. <laughs> So, one of the most feared pirates of the time, how did we go and capture it? We didn't, it was dumb luck. Uh, when we actually captured the pirate himself, it was because after the hurricane, he happens to wash up <coughs> on a deserted island. Some uh, uh, turtle hunters find him, they give him some food, they're like, you want to come with us and hunt turtles? He's like, no. Uh, you smell terrible, I, I don't want to work for a living, I'm a pirate king. Uh, so, uh, he's like, I'm going to wait for someone else to come along. They're like, that's probably not going to happen. He's like, yeah, I'll wait. So, he's chilling out on the beach. A ship comes along, flags him down like, hey, uh, I'm just a sailor, I'm stuck here, uh, I'll work this ship if you can, you can get me a harbor. They're like, great, welcome aboard, because of course this is a huge fear for all sailors. They're, of course they're going to help someone. So they bring him aboard, they're like, great, you can you know, help out, work along the ship. And uh, someone who was a passenger on the ship is like, ah, hmm, Captain, a word, uh, that's Charles Vane. And as soon as you go to sleep tonight, he's going to take over your ship immediately after murdering you, right? Uh, we know who he is. Uh, so, uh, they're like, okay, uh, back on the island. Uh, and if you're there when we come back, we're going to take you to Jamaica and hang him. So he's like, alright, I'm going to try my luck again and wait for another ship to come along. Is that going to happen? It actually happens. Another ship comes along. They pick him up. He's like, hi, right, I am totally not a pirate. Uh, would you uh, bring me on board and let me help? And they're like, sure thing. So that uh, ship picks him up about two weeks later when the other ship was supposed to schedule back. He's like, no problem. So they're taking off from that little deserted island. The first ship passes by and says, hey, how you doing? Uh, we got some mail you want to trade? By the way, that's a pirate. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sure enough, take him to Jamaica and hang him. All right. So hey, there are cases where reputational-based indicators uh, are going to work, and you actually find like, that's bad. Stop that. In this case, it was, but uh, only because a hurricane did the heavy lifting. <coughs> Um, come back to Kelly Jack. Let's see. Uh, when they decided to go after Blackbeard, it was because Governor Spotswood decided, as an upstanding governor, we need to capture this pirate. Uh, at least that was the public face. Really, is because he was so many scandals. He like we got to cover this shit up. Because uh, <laughs> he had been embezzling. He built himself a palace. He declared himself uh, a, a scion of the Anglican Church, and it was his ability to make priests. Just decided one day. Uh, There's all sorts of stuff going. He was corrupt as the day is long. He's like, well, we got to get people talking about something else. Let's go get pirates. So he puts together the money to, to uh, buy some ships and sets a bounty to say, let's go get this Blackbeard fellow because he had been just laying siege to uh, South Carolina uh, or North, one of the Carolinas. Um, so they buy a couple of smaller sloops 
which was again a really, really necessary part of going after pirates because when the military would show up again, you'd be like, we got a huge warship, we're going after pirates, pirates like by, uh, they scamper off a river and they're, you know, sometimes canoes at this point, right? Uh, they had much smaller ships, uh, they go where, where the big ships couldn't. So they offered that uh, and then uh, they <laughs> capture him uh, and then he's pardoned by the governor because <laughs> they have a side deal. Uh, so they actually managed to capture this pirate. It didn't really stick because uh, the governor here was getting a cut. So when they actually did capture him, because they were at anchor and totally hungover. <laughs> Told you they'd come back. There's a couple of pirates. I, I think there's another one, but we'll see if we get to it. Uh, but yeah, uh, Blackbeard was caught because they had, you know, they were they had a bunch of money. They're partying. They're hanging out in this little bay where it's safe to anchor, uh, and they get caught. So uh, the military is like, hey. For the military, we're here to mess stuff up. And, and, and then they ground their ship in the bay. Crap. Okay, so they're now throwing stuff overboard just to get off of this like sandbar or something, whatever, and the pirates wake up, but they're still on over. So uh, Blackbeard, who's apparently uh, where metal started, <coughs> uh, gets up, holds a glass of liquor. Everyone else is still hung over. He's still drinking. Holds up his glass of liquor and says, uh, drink uh, he drank damnation. Now, this is the captain of the Pirate Hundred writing. Blackbeard holds up a glass of liquor and drank damnation to me and my men, whom he styled cowardly puppies, uh, which was apparently a big insult back then, uh, saying that he would neither give nor take quarter, which sounds really fancy because it's old fa fashioned, but he's basically saying, fuck you, we're going to war. And they did, they lost. They beheaded Blackbeard, captured all of his men, and, and, and finally got him. Uh, a lot of them were, uh, because they thought they were going to take him, but the um, pirate hunters, they hid below deck uh, and then swarmed out and captured him. They weren't expecting that. They were super hungover. Uh, <laughs> uh, the last thing they, they had to, to do was chase Caesar, um, who was uh, 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 one of the, the pirates working there. Uh, he was a freed slave, uh, which occasionally the pirates would do. Not that they had like some moral problem with slavery, they would totally sell it. Slaves, but if you happen to be uh, free or, or willing to work for it, uh, once you signed on as a pirate, you were 100% equal. <laughs> right? Caesar is actually in charge of taking the match uh, if the pirate ship took, got captured to all the gunpowder and blowing it uh, all up. Uh, so the last part of that was like, okay, we got Blackbeard's head. Like, where's that guy going with that match? Uh, and had to chase him down, stop it. <laughs> So that's how they were able to finally catch that. Now, even after the pardon, Calico Jack, another big name, uh, didn't give up. Um, he attacks Kingston, which is, again, baller move, because this is one of the established cities in the way. He's like, I don't care. You got government, military, don't care. Still going after you. Uh, maybe not the smartest thing to do. So privateers, again, go out and find him. They find him because he went back <laughs> to the same spot to anchor while he was sleeping well. Right? Totally hungover in the same spot. Again, one of the only reason they're able to find these people. Uh, so they take him to, uh, they um, uh, able to finally capture him. Uh, they take him to Nassau. He's like, oh, I'm going to accept that pardon. <laughs> uh, and goes free, goes back to pirating. Uh, he did this with his girlfriend, uh, Anne Bonnie, uh, and her girlfriend, uh, Mary Reed, uh, some of the first cross-dressers in, in public record. Uh, again, if you were willing to sign all part of those articles uh, uh, to be a pirate and join up with a crew, no one really gave uh, a whole lot about, uh, about your ideas, where you came from, where you're going. You were a pirate, that's what mattered. Um, so they would hang out together, um, and apparently a long record of disgruntled husbands being cuckolded. This is a whole thing they did, so this is like in the history even. Uh, but so they were fun going around, still robbing people, uh, and again, eventually got caught uh, when they were hung over. Didn't learn from the first time. Um, because uh, they were able to catch them, not just because they were, they, were, uh, they were hungover, but an informant had told them where to find them. Right? Again, it came down to the threat intelligence to go back and be able to find these guys. Um, and uh, they go and they attack the pirates. All the men are hungover, like, we, we don't really want to fight. And Anne Bonnie is standing on the deck murdering dudes and screaming at all the hungover dudes to start fighting like men. Uh, and, and still ended up capturing them. Um, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny didn't uh, got out of jail uh, because they were in prison uh, long enough uh, to say you can't you can't hang us we're pregnant. Uh, they both managed to, to uh, set that up while they were in prison, uh, so they got set free. 
Uh, like it's, they barely knew how to handle women pirates at the time. Uh, it was not something they were set up for. And they're like, oh, okay, a baby's too much. We got yeah. So they got to go free. Calico Jack got hanged. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was outside of Jamaica, uh, Jamaica that's still called Rackham's uh, K or, or Bay. Right, right, right. The Barbary pirates. Uh, well, again, the American Navy wasn't up to the task. The, the Marines had to go in by land. And a whole, a whole other way, but we did see how that was able to work and take down those pirates. And then John, with John Lafitte, again, they had to take him by land. These guys were too good on sea. They would just scamper off whenever the military would come. And frankly, uh, the military would often botch it up when they'd be like, well, again, roll in. We're the military. We're here to, uh, you know, we're here to, to, uh, to mess stuff up. Uh, as soon as we're done pooping, like three weeks from now, because they'd never been to the tropics before, they all got sick, right? <laughs> Huge problem. Again, so they'd never been to the tropics. There's these British guys walking around in their wool coats um, in, the, in the tropical heat. Uh, eating uh, hardtack, because they don't trust foreign food, uh, and, and they're just getting sick, right? So, uh, attacking them by sea really didn't work. Again, they had to go in by land, uh, and still ended up hiring him. He still became a war hero. There are still like monuments in New Orleans set up uh, to this, this pyro. Again, they still had to attack him again when he was set up in, uh, in Galveston. Um, at that time, was I still think part of Mexico. Uh, so again, what can we learn? Um, first and foremost, uh, respect. Uh, these aren't just like, uh, I don't know, someone driven to mug someone on the street corner. These are career criminals. Um, we often think less of them, but these are guys whose incentives, whether they get paid and whether they live, depends on whether they figure out how to be a good and effective pirate, and they did. They figured out a lot. Again, their social structure was was, was incredible. The um, I talked about in um, uh, my previous pirate talks a lot of the tactics they come. They uh, it seems like pirates invented suppressing fire. Uh, they were the first like use that as a tactic, right? Uh, um, and, and frankly, a lot of other uh, ship to ship tactics as well, because their lives were on the line, and that was a huge incentive, right? Private in the navy is like uh, I don't know whatever bare minimum I need to do to stay out of trouble, right? Uh, and I'm getting paid next to nothing. Pirate, I'm like, I'm making 20 times what you make. Uh, I am in this to win it, right? Um, so nobody really thinks they're the bad guy. A lot of these people that became career criminals, they, they weren't, uh, they didn't think they were bad. They thought they were working for the right people or the disposed government or whatever it was. Uh, this is proper in our religion. Um, and, and we certainly, and we've absolutely seen that in some of time as well. There's something I talked about last year. I was talking about exploit kits. Uh, specifically, uh, but to draw from that again, when they went and a rush, uh, arrested this Russian guy, uh, like in St. Petersburg, he was running this whole, uh, you know, uh, exploit kit in Botnet or whatever. Uh, they arrest him. Uh, reporters go and interview his neighbors, like, hey, did you know your neighbor built this thing? They're like, well, what does that even mean? And they explain it, like, he built this elaborate system to attack American banks, and his neighbor's like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> Because these Russian criminals running these botnets don't attack other Russians. So it's pretty okay with that, right? So we draw these lines. You're somebody else. I'm not going to attack you know, my people, but I'll attack somebody else. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? Well, we all laughed in the keynote address and we're like, oh, yeah, people from Michigan, right? Same idea, but it's, again, that's kind of thing that gets exploited to say, like, I'm not a bad guy, right? Uh, and uh, fools rush in. Uh, these guys would go in just assuming we're the military, we know how to mess stuff up, immediately get a tropical disease. Their ships are, are running in the sandbar because they don't know the local terrain as well as, as the bad guys. And again, uh, can't chase them up the river they're scampering off of because their giant warship isn't built to chase these little pirate ships. So they really had to adapt. Uh, you had to prepare. You can't, you actually had to prepare. The, uh, the tropical climate was so bad that their sails were rotting, their anchors were rotting, they were getting way more bugs and worms in the wood than they were really used to because it was this whole other climate and they weren't prepared for it. Um, and they couldn't replace their masks because there weren't trees big enough in that part of the world. Uh, the shipworm was eating through their hull so they had to careen uh, even more regularly and they didn't have docks large enough to do that. So like, hey, we're here, we got, oh, okay, clock's running, we got like a, a month and then we gotta go back to England which is a huge journey, just so we can scrape all this tropical nonsense off the bottom of the road. The men are already suffering from a poor diet. Uh, that's a big difference between being a sailor and for the government and being a pirate. Pirates had plenty of food <coughs> and plenty of rum, uh, <coughs> working for the Navy, barely enough to eat, right? 
Um, but they weren't acclimated to the heat and to the humidity and all the other problems. They're walking around their woolen clothes, right? All they've got is salted meat, um, uh, huge heavy biscuits like hardtack, right? Uh, and beer and rum. So they basically dehydrate themselves immediately off. Um, they weren't even ready to fight when they got there, and then, yeah, they got all sorts of diseases. Let's see, we got black beer, they captured him, we sort of talk about that. Damn pure. Uh, again, uh, some of them were so unprepared for that, this guy seals down there, is like, okay, I'm going to go catch pirates. Doesn't take care of his ship. Doesn't go back to England to careen and scrape all the barnacles off there, and has a mutiny for it. One guy says, you are so bad at being a captain. This ship is so unsafe, you're dropping me off of that deserted island. They're like, you'll die there in like weeks. He's like, better odds than staying on that ship. So they drop him off there. Uh, they sail back like, I don't know, a year later, and he's like, hey, what's up? Uh, they're like, oh my god, you're still here. Do you want to come aboard? He's like, sure. And he sees the old captain. He's like, put me back on the island. <laughs> Literally, this actually happened. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. And they're like, no, 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 he's not the captain anymore. He's like, no, 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 put me back on the island. It's like, we promise he's not the captain, uh, and we'll, we'll take you back if you change your mind. He finally agreed uh, to stay on the ship. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it, they, so they, this, that was after they mutinied. He got three course marshals for just running the ship into the ground. It was so unsafe. Um, Uh, when then when uh, yeah, it was Alexander Selker, uh, he met when he got back to England. Eventually, he met an author, told him his tale uh, of living uh, on this island. Uh, that guy went on to write uh, Treasure Island. It's actually where the story came from. All right, uh, and I have a bunch of books here uh, that that I read. If this is all interesting to you on pirates, if uh, if you'd like to check that out. Um, well, mostly I think that we have a few options to pursue to actually go and look at how we hunt down pirates. The one I'm most intrigued about is, in, is uh, creating privateers. Uh, and I don't have nearly enough time to go into the legal framework. I've started learning it myself, but I believe that will be my, my next talk. Because I think we can actually have a legal framework to say, uh, yeah, if you go after the bad guys, we can make that legal. Maybe we can set up some prizes to do that. Uh, there are all sorts of problems with that. The debate on whether or not it's okay to hack back is one that's been raging in this community for a long time. But I think it's also one they solved with this legal framework of going after pirates, something I want to uh, explore in a whole lot more, more detail and hopefully at the, the next conference I, I present to. So uh, I hope that was interesting. If you have any questions, uh, I think we've got a, a couple minutes, maybe otherwise I'll certainly stick around. And thank you uh, so much for, for, for coming to this talk.